Let's get started. Um, welcome tonight to Smilo Shares with Primary Care. We're talking about bladder cancer tonight. Uh, my name is Ann Chang, and I'm here with um, Dr. Karen Brown. Um, and let's see if we can bring the slides up. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining. As you know, this is a monthly um, lecture series that we have that's really focusing on, on primary care perspectives. Uh, it's a case-based discussion and really uh, developed with our primary care um, NEMG faculty and our smile specialists um, to really cover things that are important and interesting to primary care docs. Um, we have two more uh, after this uh, year, um, so we'll, we'll show those at the end. Uh, so we're going to do some introductions first, and then we'll jump into our cases. As always, we try to leave a little bit of time at the end for the questions that you have, uh, which are really terrific. Um, and uh, we'll go into uh, introductions. Uh, Dr. Brand, you want to start off? Sure. So it is my pleasure to introduce Drew Cutney, who is a Northeast Medical Group internist. Uh, in the Bridgeport region and has been in practice since 2008. He uh, did his undergraduate degree at Thomas Jefferson and then University of Rochester where he completed a MedPeds residency. He is active body, active mind, the very persona of practicing what we preach um, in primary care. And I'm so glad that he could participate today. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mike Hurwitz. He's an associate professor of medicine uh, and co-leader of the cellular therapies program at Smilo Cancer Hospital. He cares for patients with kidney and bladder cancers. Um, as a graduate of Harvard College, he received his doctorate degree in cell biology from Rockefeller University and his medical degree from Cornell. Uh, he did his fellowship at Dana-Farber and a postdoctoral fellowship in biology at MIT. And he joined um, Yale Cancer Center in 2009. He uh, helps to run our, our fellowship program and is really a great teacher. He actually just got our Yale Cancer Center Award in Teaching uh, just last week. So thanks for joining, Mike. Uh, and then I'd like to introduce Dr. Joe Brito, who provides general urologic care to patients in the New London area. And he focuses uh, on minimally invasive techniques for managing prostate, bladder, and kidney cancers. He attended Middlebury College, uh, followed by uh, George Washington University School of Medicine. Uh, he did his res residency in urology in, at Rhode Island Hospital uh, and Brown and trained at Yale uh, in clinical oncology. He's a member of the American Urologic Association. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Cutney Drew. All right, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Karen. Um, happy to be here with uh, Dr. Hurwitz, Dr. Brito. Um, my job here is to uh, give a little orientation on bladder cancer um, and uh, present uh, two cases, both on how they typically present with either uh, a microscopic hematuria or macroscopic or gross hematuria. So, um, you know, bladder cancer is common. We, we see it in our offices. It's uh, fourth most common cancer for men, uh, ninth in women. There are about 80,000 new cases per year uh, and 17,000 deaths per year uh, annually uh, in the U.S. Uh, to put it in perspective relative to colorectal cancer, you know, there's about 153 thousand new cases of colorectal cancer uh, and about 53,000 deaths. So the disease prevalence is lower, um, uh, but it is it, it is obviously seen in our in our practices. The natural history of, of history of bladder cancer is quite variable. Um, we will see it present at different stages. Um, uh, uh, and that does impact um, how you know we we pick it up. 65% um, of new cases are early stage, low grade and non-invasive. Um, and the, uh, the frustrating nature of, of bladder cancer is that it's unpredictable and unreliable um, as, a, as a bleeder, you know, quote unquote. Um, you're not going to uh, 
you know, large cancers may not bleed, uh, whereas small cancers might. Uh, so there's there's not a lot of correlation between um, between bleeding and size or or uh, stage of tumor. Uh, one interesting note is that bladder cancer is very rarely incidentally found on autopsy. Uh, you know, alone, meaning it will present itself at some point. Um, next slide. Uh, we have modes of, of looking for asymptomatic uh, disease. Uh, the urinalysis is present in cytology, urine biomarkers, we have multiphase CT imaging, and we have cystoscopy. Um, you know, preferably these these mechanisms will help find, you know, early stage disease um, and with, that's cheap and it's safe and it'll pick up, uh, you know, the disease in time to intervene and prevent morbidity and mortality. Unfortunately, none of these are uh, sensitive and or specific enough to work alone within average risk or high risk populations. And adds, you know, again to the frustration of you know of screening for bladder cancer, which is primarily what we do in primary care. We we like to do that. We like to pick things up early, um, but we this is a difficult disease state, and that is why the U.S. PSTF has not revised its bladder cancer screening recommendations since 2011, which, by the way, is the last time my professional photo was taken. Um, uh, in the start of this uh, this uh, presentation. Um, there was no evidence back then for uh, broad screening and there still remains uh, no conclusive evidence. So we're, we're largely dependent on the presentation of either a microscopic or a gross hematuria situation. Um, the, you know, there are some false positives with testing. Next slide, which we have to, you know, to uh, take into account um, when we're looking at, uh, at bladder cancer. So what I'd like to go through are two cases, you know, one being microscopic hematuria, one being gross. And uh, we, we decided to pair uh, microscopic hematuria with the non-invasive uh, bladder cancer discussion. This does not mean that Microscopic, you know, bladder and non-invasive tumors present uh, with micro, uh, microscopic hematuria at all times. So I wanted to pick a patient that I have seen um, in in my office uh, presenting with microscopic hematuria. He was 64, uh, presenting for an annual um, preventive visit, had no complaints. He was overweight, hypertense, had some hyperlipidemia, was taking some lisinopril and Lipitor. He was married, had healthy kids. He had a 10-pack year uh, smoking history, that, but he quit 34 years ago. Uh, largely sedentary, uh, had eight standard alcoholic drinks per week, no illicit drugs. Uh, he did work in manufacturing as a quality control manager, and he also worked for a period of time in a textile mill in lower Manhattan in the 70s. Uh, family history is notable for hypertension, diabetes, gout, heart disease in his father, and his mom had breast cancer um, diagnosed at age 74. Both are deceased. Next slide. He had, he was up to date on his uh, cancer screening. Um, colonoscopy, two colonoscopies were, were normal, no polyps. He chose PSA screening only for uh, prostate uh, his PSA was always less than one. He didn't have any lower urinary tract symptoms. Uh, he had urine. He had uh, blood work done prior. Uh, the blood work was normal. The urinalysis uh, will comment below, but uh, largely on exam, he has uh, maybe a little elevated diastolic uh, pressure. He was borderline obese, and he had a hemoglobin one plus hemoglobin on his chem strip with five RBCs on the. Urine microscopy with no crystals or casts. So what do we do next? Well, I want to think a little bit about the urine dip. Um, we use it a lot, um, largely, you know, a, a test uh, that's not a point care, but um, the, when we send it off to the lab, there will be a reflex microscopy. And what 
the urine dip is really good at is at rolling out the presence of RBCs in the urine. Uh, can it is sensitive uh, to a level of one to two RBCs per ml. Uh, and it will effectively rule out hematuria if it is negative. How it does that? I thought we'd go back to you know earlier training days, uh, maybe even second year of med school, I believe, in the introduction to clinical medicine, where you learned about the RBC and peroxidase. And uh, and basically, how the R the red blood cell handles oxidative stress is through these enzymes called peroxidase. And on the um, on the urine dipstick, there's a benzidine dye that will change color when it's oxidized by peroxidase. Um, you know, there's a direct correlation between amount of color change um, and the amount of uh, peroxidase exposure. Uh, the the technical term is that the RBC and the hemoglobin are both they call it pseudo peroxidase. They have peroxidase activity. It's not a true peroxidase, but I think that's a technicality we can we can uh, live with. But um, when you're looking at the RBC, we have to always have to think about false positives. What can cause false positives when we see a test result? And um, I think the only thing to keep in mind is that that that. If a urine out a urine pH is too alkaline, the benzidine dye chemistry is 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 not going to work. It's going to change color and give a false positive reason. The other um, the other two items are if, if myoglobin is present within the urine, maybe somebody who runs a lot, or if semen's present in the urine, both have pseudoperoxase activity, and those are really the um, the uh, you know, two of the most common reasons for a false positive chem strip. So after the chem strip is positive, we you know you, you get a reflux to microscopy. Uh, next slide, which all the urine should be inspected under a microscope, and looking for the presence of RBCs uh, per the you know high power field. And there's uh, the definition for hematuria is, is over three RBCs per high power field on a clean catch um, uh, for times two samples. So you want no epithelial cells, nothing, uh, nothing looking like there's contamination, and and if you, it is positive, you know you have microscopic hematuria. If it's negative, well, it could be negative, but we have to think about you know false negative microscopy, and that can happen in in any setting where there's a dilute urine, you know, to the point where the, the RBCs are going to lyse and uh, you know fall apart and not be visible or in people who ingest large amounts of, of vitamin C. Um, they're out there, uh, but I don't know if I've ever seen that. Uh, and we don't know the mechanism. Uh, next slide. Differential diagnosis of microhematuria is, is broad. Um, I think based on age and risk factors, I think we go through this quite a bit in our offices, but for the purposes of today, we're looking really at the, that malignancy potential. Uh, next slide. Uh, we look at, you know, urothelial your cancer risk, and um, I think it, the exposures are, you know, are, are uh, what come to, to our, our, our forebrains most, and that's you know, tobacco, manufacturing work, um, any benzene or inter, am, air, uh, aromatic amines, et cetera, um, and also thinking about past uh, chemotherapeutics or ionizing radiation. These are oxidative stresses to, to the bladder endothelium. Um, we do know that age is also a risk factor, male more than female, obesity, uh, family history of urothelial cancers and or Lynch syndrome, um, chronic indwelling foreign body, uh, foreign bodies in the urinary tract and a history of gross hematuria. And if you cannot or, you know, remember this all, uh, that's okay. We do have an EPIC within our patient navigation um, uh, interface uh, when you're when you're in the visit, there is access to care signature pathways, and this one is called I think um, it's called microhematuria. It's called micro yeah microhematuria I think um, not microscopic hematuria. But uh, next slide. The real benefit to it is it has a patient um, risk stratifier in here. And you enter your patient information, test results on the uh, urinalysis. Next slide. It will 
um, it'll place the patient into either a low risk or next slide, an intermediate or high risk category. Next slide. It's 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 uh, very straightforward to use and it's quite helpful. So you know within our case we have a high risk individual for you know reasons we talked about. We have a confirmed second year analysis that shows our um, you know six RBCs per high power field, and in this setting these risk factors we refer off to urology, and in this case we go over to talk talk to Brito to discuss. Um, non-invasive bladder cancer. Sure. Thanks, Andrew. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about what exactly happens with these patients when you send them to us in urology. Um, uh, if you look closely at that care pathway that Andrew just mentioned, there is some guidance on what imaging to order, um, which we're happy if the patient shows up with, but we're also more than happy to order it ourselves. So in general, for patients like this one who are considered high risk, um, we're going to try to get a CT scan. The CT scans are really most helpful if we can get them with contrast. Um, and truly, it's a urogram. So it's actually a, a dual or in some places, even a triple phase CT scan, which is with and without contrast um, to assess essentially any causes for hematuria. So the without phase is to show us any causes such as kidney stones. Um, and then the with contrast phase would be looking for filling defects in the urinary tract, um, any masses within the kidneys themselves. Um, then occasionally we can see larger masses within the bladder on those scans as well. For lower risk patients, ultrasound might be sufficient in patients who can't get contrast will sometimes get a non-contrast CT scan or an ultrasound. Um, but really in a high risk patient, there needs to be some imaging of the ureters and upper tracts as well. So if we can't do that with a CT with intravenous contrast, we'll sometimes take those patients to the operating room for um, retrograde pilography or injection of contrast directly up into the urinary tract from the bladder. For high-risk patients, and honestly for any patient that's referred in for microscopic hematuria, the recommendation is to proceed with direct visual evaluation of the bladder and urethra. So that's generally done with an office-based cystoscopy. Um, most patients tolerate this surprisingly well. Um, it takes us about five minutes to do in the office. We use a lidocaine jelly in the urethra, so people tend to, again, tolerate it surprisingly well. Um, if we do, oh, what are we seeing? So in general, what we're looking at is essentially the entire urethra. So in men, that entails tip of the penis all the way up into the bladder. Um, we do visualize the prostatic urethra as well in men. So sometimes that can be helpful um, for diagnosis or to evaluate urinary symptoms as well. Um, and then we directly visualize the entire lining of the bladder. Um, so we can see certainly any tumor, any stone, we can evaluate the location of the ureteral orifices, um, get a sense of what the bladder looks like overall in terms of trabeculation or any other anatomic abnormalities. Um, if we do detect a tumor in the bladder, which I um, put a couple pictures of what that might look like here on the right side of the slide, um, then for the most part, we're not going to remove it there in the office for several reasons. People might not tolerate it well. Um, we need to get, you know, a good visual inspection of the rest of the bladder, which we can do a reasonable job of in the office, but we get much better resolution in the operating room. Um, and then, of course, for good pathology and hemostasis, the operating room is sort of a better place for that. So for the most part, we'll then take the patient to the operating room for an outpatient um, resection of that tumor. Um, there's a video of this in a couple slides, but um, that's called a transurethral resection of bladder tumor or TURBT procedure. Um, that's done with a scope. So those are some of the instruments we use there in the middle picture. Um, but essentially that's providing us tissue um, for diagnosis. It provides us staging information um, in terms of how deep the tumor goes. And we'll see on the next slide what the staging looks like. Um, and it can also be curative. So we aim for a complete resection in those cases. If it's a lower grade tumor or even some higher grade non-invasive tumors, that initial resection um, may be curative and may be the only resection that they ever need. Usually this is done with general anesthesia. Um, and again, it's usually an outpatient procedure. It can be a fairly short procedure. Usually it doesn't take more than an hour. As you might imagine, if it's a large tumor or covers a large surface area, it can take significantly longer than that. Um, the pathology we get back from that operation generally dictates what we do next. So if it's a non-invasive cancer, um, superficial, not down into the muscular layer, 
um, or if it's muscle invasive is the real bifurcation. So um, once you get into the muscle layer, you're considered to have T2 disease or higher, um, and those are managed significantly differently, which we'll talk about um, in a moment. And then we also get higher low grade information about the tumor, which again can have indications or um, can give us guidance on what the right treatment might be. From a primary care perspective, I'm sure some of you have seen these patients um, you know, call the office or show up with some of these things after these procedures. But as you might imagine, um, usually gross hematuria is very common after the procedure. Um, we see that and sort of accept it within certain parameters. I mean, obviously, if a patient can't urinate or has clot retention, that would be the extreme of that spectrum. Most people will have some mild intermittent hematuria after the procedure, which is generally self-resolving. Um, always a risk of urinary tract infection whenever we're instrumenting the urinary tract. Some irritative urinary symptoms, even in the absence of infection, are also very common. Um, again, we're operating really on the bladder. It's quite irritating to the bladder itself. So a lot of these patients will have urinary urgency, frequency, dysuria, generally somewhat slowly progressive or uh, improving, sorry, for probably the week or so after the procedure. Um, and occasionally, just the, the last point on that last slide, we will see this re-bleeding phenomenon. So most commonly see this in those patients who are on some type of blood thinner who need to go back on it. But a week or two after the procedure, not uncommon to have a patient develop gross hematuria where they may have had clear urine prior. Um, usually that's really those scabs that we created in the operating room with cautery. Um, you know, you might see some of that uh, show up again as those scabs fall off. So um, just a graphic to demonstrate what the staging is for uh, bladder cancer in general uh, in that picture on the right side. So ranging from carcinoma in situ, which are these flat uh, erythematous lesions in the bladder, um, superficial bladder cancers, which just grow up into the lumen of the bladder. When you get down into that first lining layer of the bladder, which is called the lamina propria, that's considered T1 disease. Um, and then as you get down into the muscular layers, you can see um, that's considered T2 and then out into the surrounding tissues, T3 and surrounding organs, T4 disease. Um, in general, we try to risk stratify these patients. So if it's a low risk uh, patient, uh, which is generally a patient with a low grade tumor, uh, a solitary tumor and relatively small, generally less than three centimeters, um, we'll manage those patients usually with just surveillance cystoscopy. So that in general will be at three months, six months, and then uh, one year out from the initial resection. Um, and then usually once a year, at least five years out from initial diagnosis. For patients with intermediate or high risk disease, um, that would be still surveillance cystoscopy, although at um, more frequent intervals. So for a high-risk patient, that's going to be a cystoscopy usually every three months in the office for the first couple of years, um, and then at diminishing intervals after that, depending on how they're doing and if they haven't recurred. Um, for high-risk and usually intermediate-risk patients as well, we'll also offer them some type of intravesical therapy, which is really designed to prevent recurrence. Um, many of you, if not all of you, I'm sure have heard of BCG, which has been around the longest. Um, and then sort of a newer kid on the block, although still been around for some time, is the combination of using the chemotherapy medications, gemcitabine and docetaxel. Both of those are delivered intravesically, usually in the office as a series of treatments. So usually that's once a week for six weeks for um, what's considered the induction course. For BCG therapy, there's a pretty well-established role for uh, maintenance therapy as well um, for patients who respond well and tolerate it fairly well. Um, and then I just wanted to mention this somewhat newer kit on the block, which is called Adstiladrin um, or Natopharagene Firadenovic. I practice that one. Um, that's uh, really kind of coming on, on as a more um, available agent. It's coming into the health system kind of as we speak right now, working its way through the, um, through the pharmacy process. But it's a gene therapy, so also given intravesically, but um, it's an interferon alpha gene therapy that's delivered directly to the urothelial cells, really currently has a role mostly for BCG unresponsive disease, um, but another option for these patients who otherwise may not respond to the, the more standard intravesical agents. Um, we're also generally going to get some interval upper tract imaging on these patients. Usually that's um, at the initial presentation, as we discussed, and then usually we'll re-image them somewhere around two years. And then generally every two years for those high-risk patients, really to monitor the upper tracts and make sure we're not missing any recurrence up top. 
Um, and then I think I just mentioned this, but that would be the surveillance protocol for patients with um, non-muscle invasive disease down at the bottom there. And then this is just a video of what does it look like when we do these resections. So this is a cystoscopic image, what we see in the operating room. Basically, this little electrified loop that we use to scrape the tumor off the bladder wall. Um, it allows us to, as you can see, remove the tissue relatively intact. You kind of get chunks of the tumor this way. Um, and we can go deeper into the bladder wall to get some muscle, which as you um, just learned or maybe already knew, but that's really important for the staging purposes of the tumor. We wanna make sure we have some muscle to ensure that it's not a muscle invasive um, cancer. We can cauterize with this as well. Thanks, Joe. Um, Actually, um, I'm just going to cut in for a moment because there's a few questions in the chat um, that maybe you guys could uh, could answer. We have a break right now, at, and they have to do with microscopic hematuria. So maybe you could cover that those questions before you move on. I mean, I I, I can answer the first one if I'd yeah. like to stab at that one. Um, <laughs> So, so the question is, what might be explaining bladder cancer in a patient who doesn't have risk factors? The truth is that for most adult solid tumors, we don't we don't really know why they happen. Uh, there was an estimate made uh, from based on mutation of looking at a large number of, of cancers that probably like sixty to sixty to seventy percent happen at random, meaning that you live long enough, your tissue get exposed to random stuff, and eventually you get mutations. And those are what drive the development of most cancers in most people. And most people, it's just random chance. Though, of course, there are things that give you a lot more mutational insults, right? Like living in the sun without doing sunscreen um, or smoking or doing other things where you're putting yourself at high risk for mutation. So in the end, most of the time, we don't know why. Great. And then um, I think there's one other question. Do you have advice regarding patients who have persistent microscopic hematuria and a negative urologic evaluation? How would you suggest they uh, be followed? Joe Brito? Um, yeah, yeah I, can, I can take a stab at this one. I, I'm tempted to say send them back to primary care, but I wouldn't do that in this audience. That would be inappropriate. <laughs> um, you know, in general, I think we, we try to consider alternative causes, right? So certainly nephrologic sources need to be considered, especially in anyone with, um, you know, certainly any known nephrologic process or elevated serum creatinine or autoimmune disease. Um, often we will consider the urologic workup negative, even though we may have some sort of non-obvious source, like per, per, perhaps you have a patient with BPH, the prostate's not bleeding when you scope them, but these larger prostates tend to have some of these abnormal vasculature sort of structures on them. That may be a source of microscopic hematuria. Um, you know, sometimes you just have these familial syndromes where you have persistent microhematuria that you may not necessarily be able to to identify an, an actual source for. So I'll say these patients tend to be um, sometimes frustrated that we can't give them a cause for the reason they got sent to us. But I think in general, our, our goal is to rule out any major problem, rule out any oncologic process. And then I think a referral to nephrology in those patients that um, are at a higher chance of having a nephrologic process is, is definitely appropriate. Um, in those patients, they should certainly be still followed by probably primary care, unless they have other urologic issues. We usually don't follow them going forward. But, um, you know, I would say in general, um, we're happy to see them if they become uh, more significant or if they develop gross hematuria, for instance, or, you know, if that really is persistent and having any sort of impact on them in the sense that they're developing anemia or something like that, that's quite rare. But um, those would be times to send them back. But would you, I'll ask a question then. So, but, but for someone, if you're worried about them having a very, like a hard to see upper tract tumor, mm -hmm. might these people get screened occasionally with, with more imaging? For sure. Yeah. I mean, the problem with imaging and upper tract tumors is it's got to be decent size to see it in the upper tract. So um, we didn't really touch on cytology in the first part, but that's another consideration in these patients. It's, it's become somewhat controversial. I think um, when I was a resident, the 
teaching was that each of these patients, even with microscopic hematuria, would have three separate urine cytologies sent. Um, and that was a huge cost. And it's pretty rare that we find a positive cytology. And quite frankly, cytology is often negative in patients with urothelial tumors. It's only really positive in high-risk disease or high-grade disease, rather, anyway. So I think a lot of it comes down to clinical suspicion. If you have a high-risk patient with persistent hematuria, you know, my general approach is take a real close look at that nephrogram and those urograms. I think there should also be a fairly low um, low bar for a particularly high risk patient with persistent even microhematuria for a, a you know sort of an operative cystoscopy, retrograde pilograms, maybe even ureteroscopy, especially if there's a positive or an equivocal cytology in those patients. Um, and then somebody asked about the outcomes for gene therapy. I think you're talking about that at Stilidrin. So again, this is intravesical therapy. So um, I, I guess technically it is gene therapy, but it really is not like systemic gene therapy in that sense. Um, that said, how effective is it? So one of the real key studies that um, got the drug approved showed a 51% complete response rate. And again, those were patients with BCG unresponsive disease. So those tend to be difficult patients to manage. So that's pretty impressive um, in that patient cohort. Um, and again, these are people who, you know, otherwise their only real option is, um, is cystectomy. So it's, it's, I think it's a promising agent and there are a lot of similar things coming on the market. Okay, great. Is there something else, Mike? Did you say something? No. I was going to say, should we do case two? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Joe. Yeah. So we'll move on. Yeah. So thank you. That, uh, those are all great questions. Um, we'll keep them coming towards the end. So the next uh, case we're going to talk about, you know, the, the gross hematuria situation. Um, again, this is a case that came from, you know, my practice, a uh, seven-year-old year female. She had a history of type 2 diabetes with uh, some proteinuria, um, <clears throat> hypertension, uh, stage 3B, uh, you know, CKD or you know, chronic kidney disease, uh, along with some developing mild dementia. Uh, she's taking the med medications as listed here. Um, the semaglutide was the oral form or, and the ribelsis. Uh, she's widowed, lives alone, has three daughters. She has local help, um, which she, she needs a little bit. Uh, she's a retired public uh, school cafeteria employee with a 60 pack year tobacco history uh, having quit in 2020. And then after Thanksgiving of 2023, she developed uh, COVID-19 and was admitted to an outside hospital for acute respiratory failure. Uh, she had three subsegmental PEs. Uh, she did not have a DVT and she was placed on heparin um, and proceeded to experience gross hematuria. Uh, the cystoscopy, while in-house, uh, identified a six-centimeter lesion in the bladder uh, with uh, invasive features on uh, on path. Um, no METs were identified, and she came to me after the fact um, and uh, was managed subsequently. So I'm, I did do a chart review as well uh, with her and, and identified no, um, you know, microhematuria, and she had no history of, of gross hematuria. Uh, so what we do? What do we do next, Dr. Hurwitz? Managing invasive bladder cancer. All right. Thanks. So so um, I'm going to talk about uh, managing both invasive bladder cancer that hasn't spread and a basal bladder cancer that has spread. Uh, and let me go back to some stuff that Dr. Brito talked about uh, with, with invasion. You know, so we, we do care about how broad um, cancer is within the bladder, but that's much less important to us, uh, especially the medical oncologists, than how deep it's gone into the muscle layer. And that's really true for all cancers. We care a lot in solid tumors about, you know, everything starts in the in the in the cell layer on the top, the epithelium, and then it digs in. And the farther it digs in, the bigger the issue. So if you haven't yet gone into the muscle layer, uh, then we treat that with all the things that Dr. Brito talked about, whether it's BCG therapy or the fancy new thing that I can't pronounce, or sometimes we use immunotherapy called pembrolizumab. All those things are, are done for that, and they're and 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 that's one thing. But once it invades the muscle, then we know we have to do more. Okay. 
And so that's one important thing for staging. The other thing that we think about when we talk about staging is, are there any lymph nodes that are involved? Uh, and, it, and what matters is how many and where are they? And then lastly, is there evidence of cancer outside of the pelvis? Uh, and lymph nodes, by the way, when we talk about lymph nodes, whenever you hear a medical oncologist talk about lymph nodes, they're almost always talking about lymph nodes near the tumor. Lymph nodes far away, we just consider those metastases. So it doesn't really mean a, a lot to us, whether it's in a lung or whether it's a lymph node up in the neck. That's all metastatic disease. Can I have the next slide? All right. So when we think about bladder cancer and we're talking about muscle layer, uh, things that have invaded the muscle. I just want to sort of tell you a little bit about the patient journey and what's involved. So first, we're going to diagnose the bladder cancer. Once it's invaded the muscle, uh, then it, it, it at that only at that point really is it going to come to me. All right. And at that point, we're going to do imaging, usually CAT scans, sometimes MRIs and CAT scans, to ask whether we see cancer that is outside of the pelvis or in the pelvis. And if the imaging shows nothing outside of the pelvis, which I have this here as a minus sign, then we try for the cure. And the proof of that is that I put a red circle around it. And now let's talk about what that actually entails. So the next slide. Okay. So what is, happens to your patients who um, have metastatic, oh, sorry, who have bladder cancer that have invaded the muscle? The standard thing that we do, okay, I have two boxes here, and there are sort of two standards of care, but the vast majority, and really the one for which we have the best evidence, is on the left. And that's chemotherapy followed by surgery. And the goal here is for a cure, and the cure is really the surgery. The chemotherapy is supposed to um, mop up maybe excess, maybe microscopic disease that we can't see, and it's supposed to shrink the disease down to make the surgery better. When you do the chemotherapy before that, with the intention of cure by surgery, we call that neoadjuvant chemotherapy. When you do it, the surgery first and follow it with chemotherapy, we call that adjuvant therapy. For bladder cancer, the standard is neoadjuvant, meaning we do the chemo chemotherapy first. So what is chemotherapy really like for patients? Well, for this disease, it's outpatient, the, it either takes between eight and 18 weeks, which sounds like a crazy long uh, difference. And the reason for that is that there are two different regimes we use, regimens we used, one with two medications, one with four medications. They both seem equivalent. Um, and some take longer to give and some take less time to give. And that's why it's between eight and 18 weeks. And um, these are not easy regimens. So some regimens are just not that bad. There are people who I treat with prostate cancer who can work and not have a big deal when they get their one chemotherapy drug. But these chemotherapy drugs all contain a medicine called cisplatin, and that basically makes life hard. Most of these patients are not going to be able to work. Um, FMLA paperwork is something that my staff is very, very good at. Um, and then after that, they're going to get a surgery. And while the goal here is to take out the bladder, because of local anatomy, it actually is a lot more than that. So in men, you're taking out the prostate also. And the reason for that is that you can get invasion of that bladder epithelium into the prostate, right? That same epithelium, that same lining that lines the bladder, it's the same lining that goes all the way up into the ureters and all the way up into the kidney pelvises and then down into the urethra. Now, obviously we don't take all of it, but we do take the, but, but often you can get invasion into the prostate itself. And so that's taken. Um, for women, it's really even more. Uh, and not only is it a cystectomy, but generally it's a TAHBSO. And in both these cases, we're generally taking lymph nodes. There's a question about how many lymph nodes to take. I think that's still being discussed in the urology world. Um, but I don't know. Is that right, Joe? Yeah, you're nodding. So that's actually true. Um, so these are big operations. And although we didn't really talk about it much in detail, these are generally not the healthiest patients. So these are men and women um, usually in their seventh decade, in the 60s to 70s, often, most of the time, they're smokers, um, and big surgeries are often not great for them. Um, there are circumstances in which we use immunotherapy afterwards also, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, but in the setting of treatment of metastatic disease. Um, the chemo side effects which I have down at the bottom for this regimen are tough. Fatigue is a lot. A lot of people will have nausea and vomiting, okay? Everybody's going to have decreased blood counts. Some people get kidney dysfunction and some people can get nerve damage, which can be permanent. So you really got to be watching out for these people. We often stop the therapy because it's not tolerable. All right. 
What about chemo radiotherapy? So chemo radiotherapy is again, a similar concept where the idea is that radiation is gonna cure it. And we're gonna give a low dose of chemotherapy to make the radiation work better. So radiation works much better when you give low doses of chemotherapy for specific chemotypes. This is a much, much easier thing to do. Um, generally, people get radiation every day for six weeks, and every day means Monday through Friday. Um, one of the beauties of being a radiation oncologist is that you don't usually work weekends. Um, and generally, the chemotherapies we give are done either weekly or biweekly, and it's low dose and much more tolerable. Sometimes you do full dose chemotherapy before or after. That's a longer discussion. What is notable about this, though, is that um, although there have been a lot of small studies showing that that's probably as good as chemo followed by surgery, there's never been a randomized study. And it's still not really the standard. So we save this often for people who either refuse surgery because they don't want to deal with, let's say, an ostomy, or in people who we think don't, won't tolerate it. All right, um, let's move on to the next slide. All right, so that is what, if you're trying for, your, for a cure, what if we don't think there's a cure, there's disease elsewhere, like in the lungs or in the bones or in the liver? Um, what about that point? So first we circle it, and then we move on to the next slide. All right, so for people with metastatic cancer, the standard of care is some sort of systemic therapy. And, we, and when we say systemic therapy, it's either a pill or something given by vein, okay, for the most part. Um, as of 2023 in September, so not long ago, the standard of care has changed. This is a huge difference. It's a drug that's hard to pronounce, infortimab, which I spelled wrong. It's not infotimab, it's infortimab, vedotin, and pembrolizumab. And um, these two, what it used to be is the same chemotherapy regimen that we gave in the neoadjuvant setting that I described before, which was cisplatin containing. So th the, this combination, not only do people live twice as long on average, that's what the randomized study showed, but it's much easier for most people to take. Um, it's given once a week um, and you get every third week off. Now, if patient's disease, the patient's disease grows after treatment with this combination, then they go back to the chemotherapy that I was referring to before, which is contains cisplatin. Um, so what are these drugs? What is EV and what is pembrolizumab? I'm going to start with pembrolizumab. Um, and first, I'm going to give an immunology lesson, which sounds torturous. But the reason I'm doing this is that the drug we use, pembrolizumab, also called Keytruda, is a drug, and it's part of a class of drugs that you will see all the time from now on in your patients, because it's given in about half of solid tumor patients. It's given in some people with hematologic malignancies, and um, it's, of course, sort of the revolution that's occurred recently in, in immunology and cancer. So we're going to talk a little about something called co-stimulation. So T cells will recognize things in the body, but they will only recognize things that are presented to them by other cells in the body. And any cell in the body can actually present um, what's called an antigen to a T cell. And they do it though, by having a protein called MHC or in humans, it's called HLA. And that HLA is sort of like a basket and it holds peptides in the basket. And those are self peptides telling T cells, this is self, don't attack me. But if the antigen presenting cell, which can be any cell in the body is let's say infected, and it's presenting like a viral protein or a bacterial protein, something else happens called co-stimulation. Can you get the next slide? That's it. And what happens is it shows that lollipop looking thing called CD80 or 86 on its surface. And that tells the T cell, do attack. This is something bad. There's something bad in here. All right. Now, that's the way the immune cells, T cells, recognize things that are foreign. Great. But you don't want T cells on forever. So the body has ways of turning it, the whole thing off. And the first way they do it is in the next slide. What they do is instead of having that thing on there, that green cup I showed before called CTLA-4, they start making called, oops, that's supposed to say CTLA-4, not CD28. I apologize. They start making something called CTLA-4. And that doesn't signal to the T cell. That actually turns the T cell off. And that's called an immune checkpoint. All right. We have another system for doing this. Go to the next slide. And that's called the PD-1, PD-L1 system. And that's another way that cells tell T cells to turn off, all right? When they make PD-L1, the T cell has PD-1 on it. It recognizes the PD-L1 and the T cell turns off. Okay, now go to the last slide. 
And where the rubber meets the road on this is that we have drugs now that block these interactions, okay? So if your body has CTLA-4, sorry, if a T-cell is CTLA-4, turning the T-cell off, but we want the T-cell to turn back on, you can give a patient ipilimumab, and that's a monoclonal antibody that blocks the CTLA-4 CD80 interaction. Or we have drugs that block PD-1 and PD-L1. Pembrolizumab, nivolumab, atezolizumab, dervalumab, there are many of them. And they block that interaction below. And these drugs basically are key because immune cells can recognize tumors as foreign, okay? And the immune cells have learned to express lots of PDL1, okay? And therefore to turn off the immune response to them. And the drugs that have really revolutionized how we treat cancer are those that allow the T cells to recognize tumors again and kill them. And that's these drugs like pembrolizumab. Okay, next slide. However, and the reason I really brought all this stuff up is that you're gonna see a lot of your patients who are getting these PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors. Um, at the very least, you're gonna see ads for them on TV constantly late at night, if you watch late, late night TV for old people, which is what I do. And these drugs have tons of side effects, okay? Now, if you get a PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitor alone, only about 10 to 20% of people will have severe side effects. But about 50 to 60% of people will have minor side effects. Um, and if you get the combination of these drugs, uh, like Ipi Nevo, for example, is a combination you may have heard of, they about a lot of people, about 50 to 70% of them will have serious side effects. I've shown you a list of the side effects here. I don't expect you to memorize them, but the key is this. When immune system goes bad, it can recognize any part of the body and attack it. And the things in red I have here are examples of things that have killed people. Now we're experienced in this. We know usually how to prevent that but you will hear about your patients presumably getting these side effects. Um, and so I wanted to bring that up. All right, um, next slide. The last drug is this infortimab vidotin, which has probably been the most revolutionary drug in bladder cancer. Um, and it's a monoclonal antibody. It recognizes something on the surface of bladder cancers and it has chemotherapy actually stuck to it. You see those red dots? Those are monomethyl or a statin E, a very powerful chemotherapy. It's so powerful, we would never give it to patients alone. We would only give it to them stuck to an antibody that gets taken up by the cancer cell. So it's much more specific for the cancer cell. It causes less toxicity in patients. It's a little bit like getting chemotherapy light, um, but, it, but it kills much better. And so, um, and that is really what your patients are, what to expect for your patients who are undergoing these therapies. They can get these autoimmune side effects. They can get chemotherapy light side effects. And, um, but they can be on these drugs for years, actually. We've had patients on them. I think at Yale, the longest patient's been on for about seven or eight years, um, doing very, very well. Um, most don't go that long, but on average, people can be on these for two or three years before they require chemotherapy. Um, and that was all I was gonna say. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back to Drew. Yeah, I think this actually, this was my slide. Just a couple points about the surgical treatment. And then I think we should have a couple minutes for questions. But um, as Mike mentioned, so gold standard really is for these muscle invasive patients felt to be neoadjuvant chemo followed by surgery. We talked a bit about what organs are removed in those two operations in men and women. Um, in general, these surgeries are being done more and more robotically at Yale. We We now do the vast majority of them robotically, although that's significantly changed in probably even the past five years or so. Um, the surgery is really two parts. So there's the cystectomy part and associated organs, and then the urinary reconstruction or diversion part, which I'll show um, a slide on in a second. Um, after surgery, these patients are usually in the hospital for somewhere between five and seven days. Um, it is an, an enhanced recovery after surgery protocol that we use, um, but even with that, it's a fairly long hospital stay. Most patients are going to go home with visiting nurses um, for at least a couple of weeks till they kind of get the hang of their urinary diversion. Um, all of these patients, for the most part, because of the lymph node dissection, which is encouraged to be fairly extensive in these patients, are going to go home on about a month of anticoagulation. Usually that's daily Lovenox, although there's some data to suggest that oral therapy is maybe just as effective now, um, and that's really for DVT prophylaxis. Um, and then we touched, uh, actually Mike touched on that last point. Um, next slide, please. So I, I put this up because I think there can be a lot of uh, misconceptions and maybe mysteries surrounding urinary diversion and, you know, what, what you're looking at in these patients post-op. 
basically there are three diversions that exist. For the most part, you're going to see the first one, which is called an ileal conduit. What that is, is um, essentially a piece of the ileum, the small intestine, which is brought out to the skin. Um, and that's the, 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 the end of the stoma there. And then the two ureters are just attached to the butt end of that loop of bowel, which is um, in the in the abdomen. So it's the most straightforward form of urinary diversion. It's incontinent. So you have a bag that you have to wear at the level of the skin um, and it's just continually draining. Uh, the next, which is considered uh, called an Indiana pouch or this continent cutaneous reservoir, as it's noted here, um, is continent. So it still has a stoma at the level of the skin, usually in the right lower quadrant. Um, it is generally a smaller stoma. For most patients, it does not require them to wear a bag. Um, and the real way to, to get that is the bladder portion of it or the continent reservoir portion is made up of the right colon. So it's a diversion that's made up of the right colon, terminal ileum, um, and ileocecal valve, which is really the, the anatomic feature we exploit for the continence mechanism. So as you know, the ileocecal valve is a one-way valve generally for intestinal contents to pass from the small into the large intestine. So in this case, we essentially flip that um, terminal ileum out to the skin and reform the large intestine into the, the bladder. So the patient passes a catheter into that limb, the catheterizable limb, it travels through the ileocecal valve, drains the neobladder, and they remove the catheter. So that gets them out of having to wear a bag most of the time. Um, and then an orthotopic neobladder would be the third option, sort of the most cosmetically normal, if you will. Um, in that case, the neobladder is made entirely out of uh, ileum. So small intestine, it's about a 60 centimeter segment that we harvest, detubularize, and then create an orbular structure out of. And that's brought down into the pelvis and anastomosed to the native urethra. So theoretically, those patients should be fully continent and urinate through their natural urethral orifice. Um, you know, why choose one over the other? So for most of these patients, they will choose the conduit. As you might imagine, it's a simpler reconstruction and therefore uh, a lot less complications associated with it. Um, sometimes the decision is made based on patient dexterity. Are they going to be able to physically catheterize a limb or not, or a neobladder for that matter, because some of those neobladder patients will not really sort out how to void with a neobladder and will require intermittent catheterization. Renal function, especially in patients that receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy, can be a factor um, if they have any sort of renal toxicity or baseline renal insufficiency. Um, a longer dwell time in a neobladder with urine can lead to significant um, systemic acidosis. So for those patients, we often don't offer neobladder. Um, and then there are certain things to monitor after surgery and then long-term as well. For instance, in a patient with a continent cutaneous reservoir, because we take the terminal ileum, which is extremely important metabolically for things like fat-soluble vitamin reabsorption, um, B12 reabsorption, those things need to be monitored in those patients going forward for the rest of their lives. So um, special considerations depending on what the specific diversion is. I think that was the last slide. Um. I can answer the the question in the chat if, if we want to do that. So the question was, can irreversible endocrinopathies occur with checkpoint inhibitors even months after discontinuation? And the answer is yes. Um, but let me say a little bit more about that. So, um, you know, what, what really happens when we give people these, these antibodies to the immune, to these what are called the checkpoint inhibitors, is that to some degree you're training the immune system. And so even after you stop giving the antibody, the immune system can kind of be trained to attack certain things. And um, so, it, so you can get really any of the side effects late. It definitely happens. I've had a patient get a terrible myositis, cardiomyositis long after we stopped. Um, and the second half of your question was, well, the other part of it was irreversible endocrinopathies. So um, and the endocrinopathies that we get for as, as side effects are almost always irreversible. So when you damage someone's lung, it's usually reversible, it's fixable. But when you damage a thyroid gland, it usually just completely destroys it. And the same is true for pituitary and the same is true for the beta cells um, in, 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 the, in the pancreas. So when people get diabetic from these things, they're usually permanently diabetic. When they get hypothyroid, they're usually, so first they start up hyperthyroid because they release a lot of thyroid hormone and they become hypothyroid forever. And the same thing is true for hypoadrenalism from pituitary damage. Um, and and I, I'll say very briefly, the really the common side effects, by the way, two of the common side effects are hypothyroidism 
and hypoadrenalism from hypopituitarism. And the other really common ones are diarrhea in the gut um, and generalized some fatigue and then rash. There's a lot of rash and itching. Um, and I would say those are sort of the most, and, and actually liver function abnormalities, but we, we monitor that. Great, fantastic. We have a few minutes left. Um, I don't know if Dr. Brown, you have any questions or if there are any other questions from the um, the audience or Dr. Cutney, if you have any questions. I, I am curious um, if any of you know about the, the concept of better screening um, because it, it seems to me that listening to these two cases, boy, if I had to choose, I would certainly want a non-invasive bladder cancer. And if there were anything that could be done to uh, accelerate diagnosis, it would be helpful. So um, obviously, uh, you know, we've, we've done urinalysis and, and blood is unpredictable and, and leads to so many false positives. It, it kind of kills us in primary care um, to try to do uh, too many urinalysis. Um, but, but what about um, some of the newer tests, the kind of molecular, are those anywhere near prime time? I know they're research only. What were the characteristics of them? Do we know? I can take it or Joe, you want to take it? I think we probably have the same feeling on this. I mean, in general, first of all, I think just from a population level screening perspective, using molecular tests is, is basically financially prohibitive, first of all. I think second of all, those agents are really out there to try to find a better option for a cytology, uh, because as we mentioned pre previously, cytology is not great. And, and cytology really only has a role in monitoring for those high-grade patients. So I don't know that those tests are quite prime time yet, and nor do I think they necessarily ever will be from a screening perspective, at least based on the current cost constraints, I would say is probably the main issue. I mean, I, I'll be a little bit more optimistic. I think that the cost of most molecular testing has gone dramatically down. Look, it's not exactly Grove's law. We're not talking about microprocessors, but um, it's gone down a lot and it will continue to go down and there will be quicker, cleverer ways to do this. There are people looking at sort of taking DNA out of, out of urine or taking cells out of urine and looking at methylation profiles and stuff. We're not remotely there. And mm -hmm. as Joe points out, what you're trying to look for, um, we can't, we're not, we don't even have a good way of doing the test to look for these kind of people. Like the, all that people are doing right now is, is secondary prevention, right? Can we see it coming back? Once we get those things working well, then we could consider doing it in a population where, I mean, you know, the population is still tiny. So, yeah, I mean, I would I would take it even a step further and say there are so many patients that, you know, Mike and I both see who, you know, they waited six months or a year with gross hematuria or some signs of disease before they presented to a primary care doctor or certainly a urologist or a medical oncologist. And of course, those patients have more advanced disease and, you know, it's a very uh, sad situation. So, I would say the lowest hanging fruit is just to say, look, if, if a patient is presenting with gross hematuria, work it up. You know, I, I think attributing that to a UTI, especially in the absence of a positive culture, and there's data to show, especially in women, that they tend to present at later stages because often they'll be treated for two, three, four urinary tract infections without a true culture proven UTI because, you know, statistically speaking, hematuria in a female is probably an infection. But if you're seeing that and you don't have a positive culture or there's any other red flags or risk factors, you know, send them right along because we'd rather work them up and have it be negative than, than miss an early diagnosis. So, I think we can draw to, uh, oh. There's that one question, which I can answer in the chat. I love it. Can porcine oh. bladder transplant be an option in the future? So um, that's like a riff on the study that was just done, the thing that was just done at MGH um, with a porcine, what was it, a kidney? Kidney. Yes. Thank you, porcine kidney. So the answer is that you'd probably have to do the similar sort of thing. So in other words, remember I talked about that thing called HLA or MHC, which is so important for the immune checkpoints. So what you'd have to do is take a porcine bladder and you'd have to genetically transfer in human HLA so that it would be recognized as something that is not foreign. And then theoretically you could for the same, you know, in the same way that you can do it for a kidney. 
Well, thanks for the smile, Lee Jung, at the end. That was a, a nice uh, little uh, greeting shout out. And um, thank you all to your speakers who who prepared so well and, and, and taught us so much today. I We really appreciate it and, and for your organization. And and thank you all for attending. So um, make sure to, to do the the um, the survey at the end so you can get CME credit and uh, appreciate your continuing to to um, attend and our speakers today for for sharing their wisdom. Thanks a lot. Have a good right. night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.